talking Devin White, NFL draft, right tackles, and quarterbacks with Brianna Dix, team reporter and writer for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's on today's episode of Locked On Bucks. You are Locked On Buccaneers, your daily Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. <laughs> What's up, Bucks Nation? Welcome to today's episode of the Locked On Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is your daily podcast covering the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, so please subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, so you always get the latest episodes when they drop. I'm David Harrison, staff writer for BucksGameDay.com, part of Sports Illustrated's Fan Nation. My co-host, James Yarko. Deputy editor of BucksNation.com, part of SB Nation. Not here for today's episode, but Brianna Dix, team reporter and writer for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, is here. So let's get straight to that conversation right now. All right, guys, joined now on Locked on Bucks by Brianna Dix, Buccaneers writer and reporter on Twitter at Brianna Dix NFL. If you're not already following her work, make sure you definitely are so you can be the smartest Buccaneers fan around the water cooler. If anybody even does water coolers anymore, I don't know. That's that's what uh, that's what I've heard anyway. Brianna, I appreciate you joining us here on the program, and we got to start, right? There's two hot-button topics really surrounding the Buccaneers these days, and of course, one of those is linebacker Devin White. Now, linebackers coach Larry Foote recently comments on the situation at a press conference, and I think most of us are focusing in on the champagne problems mm -hmm. uh, comment that he made and a portion of that, but I think it's important that he also pointed out Devin isn't the first player to go through this sort of thing. Man, right. he's not going to be the last yes. player to go through this sort of thing. He also said that multiple times. And I think that's kind of getting lost a little bit in the pop poppiness of the champagne mm -hmm. problems. Part of the comment is the outside world. And I'm going to include locked on bucks because we've, we've talked about this, right? We've talked about Devin and the request and all this stuff is the outside world making more of white's trade request and contract unhappiness than there should be, or is there something to be worried about here? Um, I think it, anytime you have a player that, puts in for a trade. Once the trade, you have the quote unquote champagne problems or as foot described, this is all about money. And mm -hmm. when you have the impact on the field, obviously a player wants, they want that contract. They want the extension. They want the big, the big money, but also you have to keep into account like what this organization has gone through with the salary cap situations, the strains they've had with what they've done at trying to make a run for a Super Bowl the past several years with Tom Brady, with getting Rob Barnkowski, which with getting all of these pieces. Yeah. So you have to think that your piece of the pie is not going to be able to be what it is right now. You know, right now they're trying to form this team to make another playoff run in 2023. If you had told me coming into this offseason that the Bucs would have been able to sign Levante David and retain Jamel Dean and Anthony Nelson and sign Chase Edmonds and Baker Mayfield and Greg Gaines, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, so I think, you know, you have to kind of take everything for, for what it's worth. And I think we all know what Devin White, his energy, his, his play on the field, what he brings to this team. And, you know, at this point he's, he's going to be there when he's going to be there. But as Larry Foote said, you know, whether or not he's in the building, he is going to be there and he will be ready when the season starts. He's going to make sure that he is sending him stuff they're doing on the field or different things that he needs to be working on with technique or all those, right. these different things to make sure that he is up to speed. Yeah, and I think that's that's another important point to make here is that right now, Devin, you know, not being there, he's not missing anything mandatory. Right. He's not missing anything that's supposedly uh, supposedly involuntary. And until he does, which we'll get to that schedule here uh, in just a little bit, but until he does, I think right now there's not so much anything to worry about. Just right. maybe uh, be aware of. And of course, it's the off season. If this was if this was mid October, we'd have plenty of other things to talk about. It probably right. wouldn't be as bright on the uh, on the agenda as it is these days. Uh, of course, the next topic that some Buccaneers fans are talking about, a little bit of the concern has kind of faded around it, but an offensive tackle not being drafted uh, in this this last weekend's NFL draft, especially early on. John Spitek mentioned uh, that they you know don't want to reach for a guy. I think the, I think the analogy mm -hmm. uses you don't want to reach for a fourth round grade right. in the second round, and then you come into rookie camp or OTAs, you go, yeah, that's a fourth round guy. Probably shouldn't have done that, uh, and, and that's basically how they kind of made the decisions the way the board fell. Do you think? that the Buccaneers did the right thing, taking that approach to it, which I think everybody should be able to agree that that is probably the right approach. Um, but also, do you think maybe the team should have been a little bit more aggressive in trying to move around to go get one of those tackles in the right spot? I 
I will say that I was I was surprised. Um, I don't think really a lot of people thought the general consensus was that the Bucks were going to take an offensive tackle. I don't think a lot of people were expecting us to get Kalijah Kansi, but I think when you start really worrying and not sticking to your board is when mistakes happen. And I think coaches, scouts, personnel will tell you over and over and over, you stick to your board. And they take they took the the risk quantity with this. You had the top three tackles already off the board. Roderick Jones was gone. You had Darnell Wright that went earlier than I think a lot of mock drafts were even predicting him going. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it was they went with the best player available. And I will say, since the draft, the more film study I have done on Kalija Kansi, the more people that I've talked to, um, I spoke with his um, position coach at Pitt, Charlie Partridge. I spoke with um, one of our area scouts today. And the more digging you do, the more exceptional he is as both a person and a player. And I think yeah. not only will he elevate the locker room here and is the kind of player that the Bucks go after, but also his incredible skill set, whether it's the explosiveness, the, the short era quickness, the get off, um, the urgency that he plays with in the refined pass rush arsenal that he already has, even coming out from the collegiate level is extremely impressive. And yes, the the comp to Aaron Donald, I mean, it's hard to compare anybody to a guy, right? That's uh, a uh. transcendent player in the NFL and is going to be a uh, first ballot Hall of Famer. But I kind of go back to... Micah's first year, Micah Parsons, when I was with mm -hmm. uh, covering the Cowboys in his first year, right? There was all those comps to Lawrence Taylor yeah. and it kind of, you know, threw everything by storm. And it was like, oh, my God, you can't compare him to Lawrence Taylor. And I kind of took the approach that, of course, you can't compare anyone to Lawrence Taylor. I mean, he was a guy that completely changed the game. I mean, linemen had to change their stance because he yeah. was so quick and and Michael obviously ha had a long process to go until he worked his way up. But I think that comp in and of itself showed you what Micah could be. And I think that is a similar to the comp with Kalija Kansi. Like, yes, it's not fair to compare him to Aaron Donald and his pedigree and his resume in the NFL. But that comp in and of itself shows you what Kalija Kansi can be in the NFL. Absolutely. Yeah, I will. You know, what? I will pat myself on the back just a little bit. I don't try to do it very, very often, but I will do it right now. I actually did mock Kalaj Kansi to the Buccaneers nice. in my one and only first round mock, but only because <laughs> I was said, like the Darnell Wright love like it just it kind of I don't say it came out of nowhere, but like in a span of two weeks, he went from like a fringe round one guy to a top yeah. 15 guy. And I was like, you know what? I kind of feel like this is real. A lot of times that's just fabricated. So like, I kind of feel like this is real. So I did the same thing. I had, you know, all the tackles were gone. By the time the Buccaneers got on the clock, I know people say four. I don't think Peter Skaronsky's a tackle. That's a different conversation. Right. Um, and I did. I said, I was like, you know what, man? Like, we've been talking two years now about getting a pass rush, an improved pass rush right. from the three down linemen, so to speak, quote unquote. Uh, and Kalijah Kansi does that, I think. So mm -hmm. let's let's dive into that a little bit more, though, uh, here. What did you say? So you say you've been, obviously you've been studying more. He's with the mm -hmm. team now, so that makes sense. But right. kind of. What's a realistic expectation? Because like Aaron Donald, right? So you can, you're not going to get Aaron Donald year one. And let's be honest, Aaron Donald wasn't Aaron Donald in year one either. Right. Um, but what is a realistic expectation, do you think, for a guy like Kalaj Kansi, especially playing next to Vita Vea? Mm -hmm. Well, I think he can certainly start off and be in the rotation for a three-tech next to Vita Vea. And I think the biggest thing for him is just going to be continuing to build that strength in the NFL. And obviously he doesn't, you know, he has the, the quote-unquote size knock. Um, and obviously at the point of attack, it's a little bit different in the NFL. Um, you know, the, the talent pool is different. So of course he's going to have to go through that learning curve, but I'm just going to be honest with you personally. I think the undersized knock is a lot of times BS. Um, and I think even when you look at the Bucks history, I mean, you look at Levante David undersized, you look at Antoine Winfield undersized, and I think that doesn't necessarily dictate production in the NFL. I think it goes to, okay, what is this person's work ethic? What is their drive? What, how do they want to succeed and what are they willing to do to get there? What is yeah. their film study and their process look like in private? And for Kalijah Kansi, it is, he checked all of those boxes. And for me, 
I think, too, one of the most impressive things is you think about a guy that's maybe a little bit bigger or he's taller. He can get away with some deficiencies or he can get away with not having a perfect technique every every play. But with Kalijah being 6'1", being 281 mm -hmm. pounds, he has to be dang near perfect in his technique at the point of attack every time because some guy can maybe get away with standing up a little bit more. But for Kalijah, he can't do that. So I feel like he has used that, in essence, to his advantage in gaining natural leverage um, on, on players. Um, and also, he's just a well-rounded player. You know, it isn't just, oh, he's a great – pass rusher he's good against the run he, mm -hmm. he can do it all I mean he lined up at nose tackle he lined up at edge he he lined up at every single thing and he was productive everywhere he lined up and I mean was dang near unblockable in in a one-on-one -on -one situation so whether it was you know two gapping whether it was firing off I mean he's a guy that has is a well-rounded and ha has all of those things. So I'm excited to see what he can bring to to the Bucks interior. And I think he's going to, to elevate this team and be a really special player in the NFL. More coming up here with Brianna in just a minute. But first, we got to talk about Built Bar because if you're looking for a delicious snack but you don't want all the sugar and all the calories and you need to try the best-tasting protein bar ever, Built Bars are so healthy and they taste amazing, so amazing that you're not even going to realize that it's good for you because it's covered in 100% real dark chocolate with unbelievable flavors available like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. They taste like candy bars, but they have amazing macros with just 130 calories, only four grams of sugar, but they bring you 17 grams of protein. You can get them at Walmart or at Sam's Club, and your specialty flavors can be found at Built.com. Walk to the pharmacy section of Walmart, and you'll get a four-bar box of cookies and cream bar, double chocolate bar, and the coconut puff. And if you go to Sam's Club, you can grab a 13-box 13 bar box of brownie batter puff and churro puff and make sure you head to built.com check out animal cookie bar peanut butter puff and snickerdoodle chunk puff built bar you got to try this thanks again for being a locked on but your first listen or your first view today and every day and a special thank you to all of our everydayers who are coming through here five days a week with us wrapping up the week this week with Brianna Dix, staff writer and reporter for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Buccaneers writer and reporter Brianna Dix joined us here on Locked on Bucks today on Twitter at Brianna Dix NFL, spouting all kinds of knowledge about Kalija Kansas. I love it. That's why I wanted to get you on the show. We tried before the draft. I know you were super busy, but now that we got you after the draft. I mean, this is this is exact. Like, I'm just like, you know what? Usually I'm like, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I like to like kind of interact, but I'm like, I'm just going to like, I just I just got to listen. Like, that's that's the kind of stuff we bring you on here for, Bri. I appreciate it. Um. And I'm gonna be honest, like it was, it was, it was really a smart transition. I'm trying to ask you about the offensive tackle position. You flip over to Kalaj Kansi, you distracted me, but we are gonna come back to this offensive tackle situation. Yes. Um, and I like what you said about Kalaj Kansi, all the size and everything. It's not a problem unless it's a problem, right? Yeah. And uh, I know the movie Draft Day is not an accurate depiction of what happens in an NFL draft day, <laughs> the life of a general manager, it's but it's it's a very it's a very popular reference, right? And that's right. one of the things. That's actually one of the lines from the movie I actually really liked was. Let's find out what the issue is and let's find out if it's an actual issue is and I'm paraphrasing Kevin Costner there, but I think Kalaja Kansi is that type of uh, mm -hmm. a player. And when you look at right tackle or left tackle, I suppose, um, right now the Buccaneers have a hole and mm -hmm. everybody's worried it's going to be an issue. But again, it's one of those things that's not an issue unless it becomes an issue. And there's been some, some, some votes of confidence given out in some comments and some press conferences. Do you think there is a favorite right now? Like if you had to kind of pencil in someone, to be that starting, I'm going to say right tackle. You don't have to confirm or deny anything. Um, do you think there's a favorite and how many competitors I've heard three, I've heard really, there's only two guys. I've heard five. How many competitors do you think are really fighting for this open tackle position? Um, well, right now, I think it seems like they're going to move Tristan Wirfs um, yeah. over to left tackle. And then I think you're going to see Luke Gedeke getting in, getting in work on, on the opposite side. And then obviously they drafted, uh, Cody Mock, who is going to be a play personality favorite um, and is a mauler. So I think you're definitely going to see them getting in probably first team reps during during training camp. But I mean, you've you've got depth. You have Brandon Walton. You have neglect. I mean, you have a lot of pieces that you can move in the line that that they're working through and getting Ryan Jensen back, you know, getting some of these pieces and 
fingers crossed that we have a clean bill of health during during training camp. But I mean, I think they're always looking to to add pieces and to build to build depth. Absolutely. What do you say to people? Um, and you know, people in the media are just guilty of it too. But there are a lot of people who are willing to just write off Luke Gedicke after one year. And I'm not going to sit here and claim to be completely clean and innocent of it that I haven't, you know, uh, maybe said some things unfairly about his first year performance. But I know the coaches and multiple people have come out and said, look, this is a first year dude. He faced a lot of top level competition. Like everybody needs to, to calm down a little bit. What do you have to say to kind of maybe support that theory? Right. No, I would completely agree. And I loved uh, Jason Light, what he said at the combine about, you know, he was graded unfairly in, in 2022. Let's just be honest. I mean, for a rookie first year player, he faced an absolute gauntlet of three techniques. I mean, any way you want to look at it, he faced some steep competition. So obviously there's going to be a learning curve. And I think two people forget that that transition is extremely difficult. I mean, he not only changed sides, but positions. I mean, he primarily played right tackle at Central Michigan and then moved to, to left guard. So not only did he switch sides of the line, but he moved inside. So, I mean, you have to think that I think he um, kind of equated it to like – Writing with, I mean, he started writing with like his non-dominant hand, but I mean, mm -hmm. he's, it's like you're wiping with like your opposite hand. I mean, yeah. that, that is what he's having to work through on the field. Everything is a mirror opposite. You know, you're, you're backpedaling from the line, like all these different things. And so I think the, the pass sets was one of his biggest thing and just gaining strength. So I think this year you're going to see really a lot of those things and the things that he worked on and built this season, you're going to see them come to fruition next year. And especially during training camp, when he starts, you know, working through some of these things and you have him working, you have Tristan Wirfs working and getting that, that group up to speed for whoever's going to be under center, whether it's Baker Mayfield, whether it's Kyle Trask. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think this is one of those situations. Hopefully Luke is not taking you know, any of that press or any of those fan comments to heart and letting that affect his confidence. And I think too, as, as observers, as Buccaneers observers, whether it's media, whether it's fan, we also have to be able to understand uh, how spoiled we kind of got, honestly, watching yeah. this Buccaneers team. Ali Marpet going from right guard yeah. to center to left guard mm -hmm. and doing it all beautifully. Ryan Jensen comes in, immediately makes his impact. Tristan Wirfs does the exact same thing. And, you know, everybody, I think we all kind of lost sight of the fact that that's that's not automatic. Like that's not just how things go uh, in the National Football League. And you're right. Like those comments by Jason Light at the combine. That's actually what I was thinking of, especially when I asked you that question. Uh, really, personally, kind of was like, you know what? Maybe I am being a little hard uh, on Luke Gedeke, and, and I need to check myself a little bit. But we all like to be right, right? So <laughs> I'm super proud that I mocked Kalaja Kansi in the first round to Great the Tampa Bay Buccaneers the day before the actual NFL draft happened. Actually, it was the morning up. I think I dropped that. But I have to admit, I did not see three pass rushers being drafted in eight draft picks by the Buccaneers. Were you surprised at all by that? Or is that kind of something you saw coming ahead of time? I I was surprised. But I think after the excitement builds, and I feel like maybe I shouldn't have been as surprised because oh. at the end of last season, we, we all saw – you know, the comments from, from Todd Bowles, from a lot of the coaching staff in their desire to see more production from, from pass rushers, from the outside linebackers. And that's not a knock on Vita Vea being, you know, the team slack leader, but right. at the outset of the season, if you thought, okay, your, your nose tackle is going to be yeah. the guy that leads this team in sacks, that's probably not a great thing. Um, you know, that's what your, as Todd Bowles says, that's what your outside linebackers are being paid for. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think they're, they're really hoping to see more production there. And that's not just sacks. That's also pressures that's finishing, that's getting to the quarterback. Um, yeah. but also in all of that kind of goes, goes hand in hand. And, but, but the biggest thing is they wanted to add speed mm -hmm. and that they certainly did in this draft at a variety of positions, whether that was some of the the guys they brought on, whether that was Dennis or even on the offensive side of the ball, when you have a guy like Trey Palmer coming in, that is kind of that, that deep mm -hmm. threat. Um, you know, they really tried to bring that infusion. And I feel like that's really going to help this defense next season. Absolutely. Outside of the first round pick, well, obviously he's, he's got a lot of attention. He's very intriguing. Which mm -hmm. draft pick last weekend piqued your interest the most as it went down? Oh man. 
That's a tough one. I, uh, I literally have like three, but I guess I'll go um, both sides of the ball. And first I'll say Trey Palmer. I think that was mm -hmm. an absolute steal when they got him and they they need a guy that can join that wide receiver room, but they've also we've all talked about it. They need that speed threat, a guy that can force force defenses to to add more to to the back end that can take the top off a of defense that can. I mean, he's a guy that just absolutely blows past guys that they don't challenge at the line of scrimmage. I mean, he he forces you to add more guys and and have a lighter box because of his ability as a speed threat. Um, so I feel like that's going to definitely be exciting to see during training camp, to see some of those, those matchups with the DBs and sees what, see what he's able to do. And if he's able to climb the depth chart. And then also, I think on the other side of the ball, another pit product, but I'm very excited about Servasier Dennis. I think he's yeah. going to be a really, really great, great guy. Um, he has not only does he have like the range for days, ability to make plays up and down the line of scrimmage, but he also has an incredible tackling form um, and was really, really good against the run. So I'm I'm looking forward to see how they're able to incorporate him and in kind of learning from from the room and who who the who the Bucks currently have. One more segment coming up. We're going to talk to Brianna about the quarterback position. It's it's getting towards the end of the episode. If we're going to do it, we got to do it now. And we're going to talk about what's coming up for your Tampa Bay Buccaneers. That's next on today's episode of Locked on Bucks. <laughs> Joined today on Locked On Bucks by Brianna Dix, Buccaneers writer and reporter on Twitter at Brianna Dix NFL. Bree, I'm I'm literally looking at my list of questions here, and and the question I just asked you about which which draft pick piques your interest. I literally have something that says if it's not Servasier Dennis, because I definitely wanted to get Servasier talked about on this episode. So I'm glad that he uh, was one of those people that were on the yeah. same page. But Louisville outside linebacker, linebacker Yaya Diaby also. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very intriguing player. I mean, really, this is a very intriguing class just in general. I don't know how successful it's going to be three years from now, but it's it's a very interesting class to talk about uh, for the for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. What did you know about Yaya coming into the draft weekend, and what have you learned ever since? I I honestly did not know that much so. about him, and it's funny because I literally almost mocked him at my. Um, I think in one of my, like my seven round bucks mock, I almost took him. Mm -hmm. And then I was very upset because I ended up going um, a different route. So for like the longest time when we initially took him, I was like, yes, like I got my guy. Uh, and then I like went back and looked at my list and I was like, oh my God, like we didn't actually, actually select him. <laughs> but again, I'm, I love what they did and just kind of boosting this defense at, at all levels. Mm -hmm. um, and let me go to my little, little notes here, but um, he, I think all of these guys are people that can come in and, and fight for four spots on this yeah. team. And I think, you know, you, you can't help but be impressed by what he did this last season. Um, you know, he had, personal best in sacks and in tackles for loss. He's that impressive height, weight, speed guy. Um, but really, I mean, just the way that he wraps up blockers, he closes with violence. Um, oh. And just his his frame, that naturally explosiveness, um, has that first step to inf infiltrate gaps. Uh, I think he's going to be a big, big addition to this team. And oh. I think just adding youth and energy really at all positions is going going to help it's going to boost competition and it's going to i think end up breeding success in in 2023 absolutely i i love that you just said that and i mean all a lot of the buzzwords usually use their aggressive violence mm -hmm. so those types of things like that's what i see in this draft class as well and i'm a defensive guy no offense is you know sells tickets and and hits the highlight reels and all like you can't go to a photo mm -hmm. database and find a picture of a DB that's not missing a tackle or getting getting a, a pass on on him. But I love right. defense. I, I love the defensive right. guys, and this defense looks a lot more aggressive, mm -hmm. a lot faster. Right. Um, and I, I can't wait to see it yeah. uh, in action. And physical run defenders, which 
Absolutely. And, and believe it or not, Bree, we're almost to the end of this interview. And now I'm going to ask you about the quarterback position. We're 22 <laughs> minutes into this thing. And wow. now we're going to talk about the quarterback, something that hasn't happened in Tampa in three years, uh, at least three years, really. I mean, Jameis had plenty of conversations as well. Everybody is basically inking Baker Mayfield as the team starting quarterback, right? That's that's pretty much before he and Trask even ever take the field and have any type of real competition. Everybody's talking about Baker Mayfield being the guy. What have you got to learn uh, about Baker? We know his reputation. He's got mm -hmm. this kind of just image uh, about him, fair or not. I mean, not all that's negative, but the negative stuff, fair or mm -hmm. not. He's just kind of got this this thing that he carries with him. Um, what are, what have your interactions been like uh, with him around him, and, and what have you gotten to know about uh, supposed quarterback number one? Right. Well, I think there's a ton of excitement and just from conversations I've had around the building, I think the word that keeps being synonymously linked with Baker is Moxie. You know, he has mm -hmm. the Moxie and I know, you know, Todd Bowles recruited him when he was originally with the Jets and he loved him. He liked the leadership ability. He loved his quote unquote Moxie. And I think one of the, the things too, that a lot of people initially said about Baker Mayfield was the arm strength, you know, the, the, the arm talent wasn't there, which is absolutely astounding to me because you go back and look at his film. And to me, I mean, clearly the biggest thing is just the, the inconsistency isn't there, as he said, behind the podium, you know, that's his number one priority this season is to be consistent and to yeah. bring this team to the level that he's capable of bringing them. But you've definitely seen those flashes. I mean, I think his, the game where he came in against the ramp, for, for the Rams, and he led them with that incredible comeback victory. That's one of his best games of his career. Yeah. Those deep balls were absolutely insane. Yeah. He has the arm talent. I think the the only question mark is, can he be consistent down, down the stretch of his season? Um, but I'm excited to see what he could do. I mean, he has that mobility. He has the ability to extend plays. He has the arm talent. Um, and then I think everybody's looking forward to see – what Kyle Trask can do. I mean, I know that Baker Mayfield has the advantage with the with the experience in the NFL, the, the number of right. years that he's accumulated. But with Kyle Trask, it's like we haven't necessarily been able to see what he's been able to do because he's been lower on the depth chart behind Tom Brady, behind yeah. Blaine Gabbert. And so whenever he was throwing, okay, well, it was with to the twos or it was to the threes, but now you're going to be able to see what he's going to be able to do throwing to Mike Evans or Chris Godwin um, or Russell Gage and seeing, okay, what, what can these pieces look like together? Um, and of course, Kyle Trask is more of a reserved. He's more quiet, um, yeah. but I'm, I'm excited to see both of these guys. And I think this is one of the first true quarterback competitions this team has had in a long time. So I think for all of the coaching staff included, they are absolutely elated to see this go down during during training camp and during the offseason yeah it should be a fun competition you, you mentioned kyle Trask being reserved uh that takes me back to to monday night following the win over the new orleans saints kind of that late game uh win there in raymond james and we're walking out of uh press conference out of locker room and i literally walked right by kyle Trask. didn't even notice that i walked by kyle Trask. So i was about five steps because he's just he's just a dude but at the same time mm -hmm. That, that could be a good thing, right? Because quarterbacks, right. it's okay for a quarterback to be elevated by his teammates as well. And that's what Kyle exactly. Trask is going to be. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Trent Dilfer has a Super Bowl ring. I always remind people uh, of that as well. Finally, Brianna, we're into phase two of the Buccaneers offseason program. And I think that we need to have this conversation kind of every year because NFL fans, I think, now are smarter than ever before. But still, there can be a little bit of confusion. Can you let our listeners know what phase two of uh, the Buccaneers mm -hmm. offseason program and NFL offseason program entails? and what that leads into for the next phase. Right. So there's still no contact, no live action football. Um, it's basically just offensive players versus offense, defense versus defense. More at this phase, it's more of the, the strength and conditioning, getting their bodies back. Um, and it's still voluntary. You know, mandatory minicamp is going to be later. Um, so it's just kind of, I think, almost the – like beginning of school, you know, when the excitement builds yeah. and everybody's coming in, they're getting their bodies right. They're getting the diet set up um, and they're doing kind of the the light work on on the field, so to speak, um, as we rev up to before we know it, OTAs will be here and the start of the season. So it's not exactly the yeah. most like riveting part of, you know, the off season. And of course, like, you know, no one's able to go out and watch all of these things. Um, but it's 
so exciting to have a lot of guys in the building. They're working out and they're getting they're getting ready for this 2023 season. Absolutely. I mean, look, it's it's starting to ramp up. We've got a few workouts, like you said, and then we've got one more quote unquote dead period. Please, yeah. Uh, and that is the actual dead. Like that's the actual dead period. Of the NFL yeah, right. schedule is, right. is that period between OTAs and training camp. But, but I mean, training camp is, is right around the corner. So I think like you mentioned, voluntary and voluntary stuff. So the big thing I think for Bucks fans, if you're worried about Devin White, nothing right now is voluntary. June is the first time there is a involuntary event. Hopefully there's nothing to worry about then. Uh, but if there is, we'll deal with that when the time comes. Right. Brianna Dix, Buccaneers writer, reporter on Twitter at Brianna Dix NFL, doing great stuff. Brianna's Blitz is is a great column uh, that you all need to make sure that you're definitely catching uh, on a regular basis. Bri, I appreciate you joining us here on Locked On Bucks. Thank you so much. A big thank you once again to Brianna Dix, team reporter and writer for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Guys, make sure you're checking out everything going on that she's doing over at Buccaneers.com, especially Brianna's Blitz. That's where the uh, title of today's thumbnail was inspired from. So I want to thank her for joining us. And I want to thank you, as always, for joining us and making the, the Locked on Bucks podcast your first listen or your first view every single day to our everydayers. We will be back on Monday with a really interesting mock draft Monday version of the episode. In the meantime, if you've got questions or comments, you can send them in via email to locked on bucks podcast at gmail.com. DM us at locked on bucks on Twitter. And of course, for James Jarko, until we speak again, make sure you're checking out everything happening at bucksgameday.com, bucksnation.com, and find us on Twitter at dharrison82 at jarko underscore bucks and at locked on bucks. If you're out about, Please be safe. Have a great weekend. Be kind to one another. Fire the cannons. Thank you for joining us right here on Locked On Bucks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.